you're not concerned about inflation. Uh, I think that inflation can, can take care of itself. I mean, there are those of us who believe, like Fed Chief Jay Powell, that inflation can be tamed on its own if we just give it time. We've got a bunch of supply shortages, and those t- tend to be self-correcting historically. Production goes up, demand goes down. Problem solved! Pay no attention to the inflation behind the curtain. Yet Fed Chief Jay Powell took a page from the Wizard of Oz playbook today, and unlike in the movie, he was dead right. I mean, that's really what triggered today's rally, with the Dow jumping 189 points, new record, S&P advancing 0.29%, and then Nasdaq gaining 0.40% after being down more than a percent for most of the day. Even though the economy's heating up, Powell insists he'll keep interest rates low through 2023 because it's a mistake to worry about inflation right now. They're the ones who can't be bothered with the baby boomers' inflation obsession. They just wish us boomers would just fade away. So where does it put us? Here's the bottom line. The market's got three camps. The one that's leaving the stage kicking and screaming because they can't believe the Wizard of Oz is the Fed chief. Then the one that says, Jay, we trust. And then the ignorance is bliss crowd that just wants to go buy some Tesla or put their stimulus money to work in one of visionary ARC ETFs of Kathy Wood. What matters is that two of these three camps like stocks, which is why we rallied today instead of going down, which is what might have happened if the inflationistas were still running the darn show. There's always someone trying to scaremonger about the risk of inflation. These guys have been consistently wrong for decades. We may finally have some real inflation, but I don't think their dire predictions of financial catastrophe will suddenly start coming true. Today, though, we've seen the nasty side of earning surprises, the downside ones. And let me tell you, they're no fun at all. And we're not prepared for the damage. Two venerable companies, Sherwin-Williams and Pulte Group, both pre-announced disappointing orders. Hey, you know what that is? They, they disappointed earnings top and bottom line. Why? Supply chain problems and raw cost inflation. Wow, that's a, that's a paint company and a home builder. It comes on top of yesterday's ugly pre-announcement from PPG, the coatings company that hit us with its second shortfall in a row for the same reason. The raw cost problems now includes the price of natural gas, something we haven't had to worry about for a long time. You know, it used to hang around three bucks. Now it's approaching five bucks. That, that's way too expensive for a fuel that dominates our nation's power supply, serves as a basic building block for so many chemicals. The good news, none of their stocks got crushed because demand's still in good shape. That's right. I mean, they're still getting business. The bad news, these supply problems, they're not going away. It seems like they've become ingrained. No wonder the Federal Reserve's beige book out at 2 o'clock today, the war's assemblage of reports, showed continued elevation of inflation. It's just true. We're stuck with it, man. That brings us to problem number two. The Federal Reserve has made a big bet that inflation would be transitory. That's why they've continued buying bonds, keeping interest rates low. However, after these pre-announcements, where we keep hearing about rising raw costs, don't you have to wonder if inflation's more intractable than they thought? It's like that semiconductor shortage has confounded so many different industries, leading to higher prices practically everywhere you look. That's going to put tremendous pressure on Fed Chief Jay Powell to raise interest rates. And that is still, among most people's worries, more than earning shortfalls where I'm concerned. Hey, look, this is the way people think. This is how Wall Street thinks. You you, want to fix the housing shortage? Raise mortgage rates. You want the semiconductor shortage to come down? Well, people buy chip-filled cars with borrowed money. Raise the cost of that money, the demand will dry up. Yes! Higher rates are the magic elixir that can break the inflationary cycle, but they do that by destroying demand, and that crushes earnings, which in turn crushes stocks. Ha, 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 ha. All right. Today is Thursday, September 9th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. We start with the breaking news. 
Thank you. Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren announcing uh, individually here that he will sell all the individual stocks he owns by September 30th, 30th and reinvest the proceeds into diversified index funds or cash savings. Uh, he says he will not trade in accounts while he's ser- in those accounts while serving as Fed president of Boston. He says the investment decisions he made last year were permissible under the Fed ethics rules, but he's addressing this issue to avoid any appearance of conflict. Obviously, this story uh, comes after uh, disclosures that Robert Kaplan, the Dallas Fed president, was involved in pardon me, multiple uh, trades in excess of a million dollars uh, over the course of 2020. And uh, Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren also involved in a series of trades uh, involving a whole matter of, of, of stocks, uh, Dow, Alibaba, it looks like, uh, AT&T. He owned a bunch of residential uh, mortgage companies and other mortgage companies, uh, Verizon. Most of his trades, however, are much smaller than Robert Kaplan's, all listed between 1000 and 50000 But there were at least, I'm looking at the form now, uh, 50 purchases and sales of stocks during the year. 50 transactions during one year. Um, Steve, I- I'm just curious. You... Yeah, uh, who is it who was just saying that others will follow suit? Uh, we just got a statement from the Dallas Federal Reserve saying that Fed President, uh, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan will divest himself of his individual stocks. Uh, so all of his stocks, I'm reading this now right now live, uh, that he owns by September 30th, reinvest the proceeds in diversified index funds or cash savings. Uh, this very much is reading like Rosengren's. Uh, release as well. Further, there will be no trading in these accounts as long as I'm serving as president of the Dallas Fed. So it appears as if uh, now two people have followed suit with the, pretty much the same language and adopted what appears to be a new policy for Fed presidents not to own individual stocks and not to trade while they're uh, uh, sitting in their positions as Fed presidents, the bank presidents. And of course, last night we talked about this corrupt piece of shit Bob Kaplan, who got caught trading stocks while manipulating the market via printing, which is also known as insider information. You know that the Fed will buy $120 billion minimum of bonds and mortgage-backed securities to prop up the stock market. You use this information to buy stocks, individual stocks, for what purpose? Besides using that as insider information to line up your own pocket. And Kaplan was not alone. We got the news that Boston Fed President Rosengren is also involved in trading stocks and REITs while pumping the market via printing $120 billion a minimum per month in so-called emergency accommodation for the equities and real estate markets by the Fed. And of course, these so-called emergency accommodations have been going on since the 08 financial crisis. Apparently, Wall Street has been in an emergency for over a decade that requires the Fed to grease up the equities and real estate markets. The end result of this market manipulation is to make the rich richer. Who owns equities and real estate in the country? The 1%. They own the majority. You and I, retirees, workers, millennials, Gen Zers, etc. We own a small slice in the equities and real estate markets. So yes, the market manipulation by the Fed benefits us to a limited degree, but it also causes inflation, eroding the wealth and any income gains for the average American. Meanwhile, the rich use the funny money from the stock market. They dump stocks and magically the funny money, the fake money becomes real money. And they use that real money now to buy real assets. For example, scooping up land, single family homes and farms across the country. Meanwhile, the tiny slice of ownership that you and I have in the equities and real estate markets are tied in our retirement accounts. We cannot dump stocks, play market cycles, and play in the same league that Wall Street and the 1% plays in because they own the majority of the market. So when the Fed manipulates the market, distorts asset prices across the board to benefit the equities and real estate markets, who benefits the most from this policy? Is it you and I or is it the 1%, the Wall Streeters and the likes, and therefore expanding the wealth inequality gap to become the largest in this country's history? These reckless experiments from the Fed are not only destroying the economic system in this country, but also eroding away any prospects of the American dream or any financial prosperity 
for the next generation of Americans. The new generation will not have a market they can use as a wealth creation vehicle because the market will be awful, perhaps a bear market for years if not decades to come. Why? Because right now we are in an inflection point where the Fed's reckless experiment made the rich richer richer than ever before, making trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. But they have failed in their so-called public mandate. After spending trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of propping up the stock and real estate markets, yet they have failed to recover employment in this country. They have failed to create any sustainable job gains throughout their operation of propping up Wall Street. They have taken credit for all of the jobs that were created in the last few years as they were initiating the so-called quantitative easing policy to accommodate Wall Street. They told us, yes, the policy could produce some wealth inequality impact where the rich get to make a lot more money and their wealth will expand dramatically. But our policies are also responsible for creating jobs. So if you look at the glass half full part, these policies are worth it. The problem is it's not really a half full half empty glass. It's 99% empty with only 1% a drop of water in that glass. Because all of these jobs that they have so-called created since the last financial crisis, all of these jobs, poof, disappeared at the arrival of the COVID-19 virus. Where is the sustainability? Where is the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that have been printed throughout the years? How come we have never used these trillions and trillions of dollars to create a safety net for workers? When a crisis hits, they're not going to lose their jobs, they're not going to lose their income, and stay for months and months, perhaps years, in financial ruin. How come we have never created a safety net for small businesses in America? The moment we got the COVID-19 crisis, small businesses got crushed and they were pretty much at the brink of extinction. We had to print more billions and billions of dollars in PPP loans to rescue small businesses in this country. And fast forward over a year later, small businesses are still struggling in this economy and we have yet to recover all of the jobs that we have lost due to the pandemic. So isn't this a testament of the failure of the Fed's policies, that the only byproduct of the Fed's policy of so-called accommodation for Wall Street is propping up stocks and real estate values higher, creating asset bubbles all over the place and benefiting the ultra-wealthy who are punishing the workers, the poor, and middle class with higher prices, higher inflation, reduced purchasing power, and a lower standard of living. And on top of that, they use the insider information that they have to trade stocks and profit from the tragedy. We're talking about Fed officials, but also people in Congress, the Senate, and who knows where else. They're using inside information, betraying the public trust to line up their own pockets. It's a criminal enterprise ruling this country, top to bottom, and they're allowed to gamble in the casino, trade options, trade stocks based on inside information. And at what point does the straw breaks the camel's back? We've heard about these stories of corruption throughout the years, even from public agencies the likes of the FDA, using insider information about drugs they're about to approve and trading options on the same companies they're about to approve or reject drugs for. And perhaps you might have caught the trade for Moderna a few days ago in our unusual activities coverage, betting millions and millions of dollars the stock will move significantly one way or the other by the end of the week. And indeed, today we got the news that we have a treatment for Moderna, a hybrid treatment that treats both the flu and COVID-19. Again, we have corporate insiders and who knows who else using these information ahead of time, insider information to buy stocks and options ahead of time and line up their pockets. Where is the SEC? We know the SEC has been a dormant organization in a coma for years and years and years. And for all you know, perhaps the SEC chairman, Gary Gensler, also trading stocks and options using insider information. Do we even have a single public official that we can trust? Of course not. It's a swamp. It's corruption top down. And now they're going to move on and violate your constitutional rights by the day with rulings and mandates. And it goes on and on and on. Meanwhile, we have a criminal enterprise ruling this country, lining up their pockets, and that's all they care about. The Fed says we're not going to end the emergency accommodation for Wall Street because we have not achieved substantial further progress in inflation and in employment. 
Really? When we talk about employment, for example, we got the news yesterday that in the month of July, back in July, almost two months ago, we had more jobs openings than those unemployed looking for work. So what is the definition of substantial further progress, Mr. Powell, Mr. Williams, Mr. Kashkari, Mr. Kaplan, Mr. Rosengren, any of the Fed zombies? What is the definition of substantial further progress when you have more jobs open than people looking for work? And today we got more news regarding employment. Even with Delta, the weekly unemployment claims fell to a record low since the pandemic so once again what is the fed waiting for to start ending the so-called emergency accommodation for wall street when it comes to inflation we talk about it every day about prices rising significantly higher across the board from shipping to sourcing to transportation to consumer goods and services across the board prices are surging higher with no stop in sight at all, the Fed continues to beat on the drum that inflation will be transitory. But what is the definition of transitory? Again, the criminal enterprise remains vague in their definitions. Oh, and by the way, they're not using a formula to guide them in determining what is too high and too much inflation. And we continue to hear from companies across the board in earnings calls, warning over and over and over again that these companies are treating this inflation as permanent, not transitory. What does that mean? They're raising prices and they're pushing those prices down to us, the end customer. Those extra living costs are eroding any wage gains we're having right now. And at the end of the day, this will leave us, consumers, with a weaker purchasing power and a lower standard of living. Our rents will go higher. Our grocery bills are going higher. What we pay at the pump will continue to go higher. And the Fed chairman himself, Jerome Powell, says, when we talk about transitory inflation, we don't mean that prices will go down. Prices will not go down, but the acceleration of prices going higher will slow down. Ask yourself a question. Does that help us at all, knowing that we will stuck paying these high prices for years to come, forever? When your rent go higher, 20-25%, Powell says the rent will not go down. But next year, or perhaps the year after, because they've never defined what transitory is. But at some point, your rent is not going to be increasing by the tune of 20-25% to every year. Yet you're stuck paying those extra 20-25% that you have incurred in the so-called transitory inflation. Meanwhile, your wages did not go higher, not by much at all. And now inflation has become rampant and a global phenomenon. So again, when the Fed says we're waiting for substantial further progress when it comes to inflation, what are you waiting for, you criminals? Today we got the factory inflation from China. Remember, this is the deflation source for these propagandists. Deflation is coming. Disinflation is coming. There is no inflation. Don't worry about inflation because we have tech and we have China. There goes your China, your deflation source. Commodity boom pushes China's factory inflation to 13-year high. And again, Chinese factories will be passing the extra cost to the end customer. Factory gate prices rose in August at the fastest pace since the 2008 financial crisis. Inflation is surging higher in Russia, prompting rate hikes in that country. Inflation is rising higher in Brazil and evolving into stagflation and now they're scrambling to act fast to control the stagflation crisis in that country. Inflation is rising higher in Egypt. Inflation is rising higher in Ghana and many other countries across the globe. And of course, inflation will be discriminate, hurting and targeting poorer countries the most. Thank you to the Federal Reserve. Unfortunately, in this country, Americans remain comatose in a zombified state, unable to perform any critical thinking, unable to see the disastrous impact of this reckless monetary policy and demanding change. But perhaps this will get your attention. Perhaps this is the straw that will break the camel's back. And finally, Americans will rise up and start speaking about the crimes of the Fed. Because beer prices went up higher by the tune of 70% year over year. And you're going to continue to pay more and more and more for beer. Why? The shortages of grains to begin with. On top of that, the shortages in aluminum and the cost push inflation in aluminum prices due to the labor shortage, the strikes and the fires, and all the weird events going on in the production lines. And all of this being built on the reckless monetary policy from the Fed, ushering the tsunami of liquidity all over the place. Unneeded liquidity. The byproduct of this liquidity is 
endless inflation. Inflation is not rising higher just due to supply shortages and supply bottlenecks. The core and main source for inflation rising higher across the globe is the reckless monetary policy. Inflation has always been a monetary phenomenon, and we have the easiest financial conditions in history. What do you expect going to happen when we have the easiest financial conditions in history? Of course, they're easy not for us. We still have to pay double digits in interest rates on our credit card bills. We still have to pay over 3% of mortgages. These easy conditions are for the banks and Wall Street. The 1%, they're the one enjoying the easy financial conditions. And they're using all of that money printed out of thin air, racked as public debt for the next generation in this country to deal with trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. That money is going into the hands of the ultra-rich and they're using the money to scoop up properties and real assets across the country. This is indeed the crime of the century. And now we have an incompetency crisis on top of that. Reckless policy, criminal activities with insider trading, and now we have incompetence on top of that. For example, today, Secretary Yellen warned of irreparable damage as the debt crisis looms. Your beloved politicians, they cannot come to a budget deal and they will not be able to come up with a budget deal because they want to rack up debt like crazy. The budget deficit is in the trillions and trillions of dollars. There's no way, even with cuts, to cover that gap. And of course, they want to go crazy with the spending. Why? Because perhaps this is the last time they will be able to spend with low interest rates. As inflation continues to rise higher, those interest rates will have to move up higher at the cost of destroying the growth in the global economy and perhaps crashing the stock market. And the bottom line is, folks, we talk about the stock market and the economy every day in this channel. And it's all fun and games. But at some point, you have to realize that things are getting out of hand. And when things get out of hand, the economy and the market will suffer irreparable damage, as Yellen would say. And therefore, you have to be extremely vigilant and wise in your investment decisions. If you get indulged in this pipe dream, this la la land of a hyper bubble, assuming that the Fed got it and the Fed got our backs, perhaps you ought to wake up because nobody got your back, because these criminals will pump and dump and look at you as collateral damage when the crash happens. They have scored a lot of money from insider trading, and now we have Kaplan and Rosengren at least. We're going to hear more from other Fed members, also announcing selling their stocks and divesting out of the market, perhaps holding cash now that they're getting closer to tapering, raising interest rates, and perhaps ending the orgy. They say, don't fight the Fed. This is the golden rule of investing in the market. So aren't we fighting the Fed being invested in this market while Fed presidents themselves start to divest away from it? Just food for thought. For now, we're moving on to cover the market's performance today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red down 151.69 points or a decline of 0.43%. The Nasdaq down by 38.38 points or a decline of 0.25%. The S&P 500 down by 20.79 points or a decline of 0.46%. Moving on to the sector's performance. What's going on here? Bad picture, losses, weakness across the board. And therefore, we're not giving away any medals today. Even though financials and materials managed to close in the green slightly, while the decliners led by REITs, healthcare, and defensives. The market has no theme right now. The defensives that were popping higher yesterday are now being sold. We're talking about REITs, of course. The dollar was down, yields were down today. This was an environment an opening for the market to rally, an excuse for the market to rally, but the market continued to sell off. Why? Because the human beings are now involved, and all of a sudden, the human beings are waking up to the fact that they have to protect their portfolio. And perhaps they made so much gains, it's not worth it to be a greedy pig when inflation is rising out of control, and the Fed will be forced to taper. Moving on to the advanced to decline ratio. The NYSE 48% advancing versus 50% declining. The NASDAQ 56% advancing versus 41% declining. Some of the chip names managed to outperform today, and this is pushing the NASDAQ a little higher in the advanced to decline ratio, but the breadth 
has been awful all along for months and months and months now. Don't say that the warning signals were not here. In a healthy market rally, you want a healthy breadth. But when the market continues to rally higher with bad internals, bad advanced decline ratios for weeks and months, you have to realize that this is a rally based on buying ETFs, algorithmic rallies. Once the human being is involved, they will get involved as a wake-up call. And this wake-up call will produce a lot of selling in the market. And therefore, the possibility of a harsh September correction. Moving on to futures, what do we see here? Losses for the WTI and Brent. Crude oil prices are going down today by about 2% apiece. Yet the gains in natural gas continue. And we have news here that the damage from Hurricane Ida actually surpassed the damage from the Texas deep freeze. So the shutdown and the shortage is pretty much the worst in history. When we talk about the weekly production fall, this is the highest in record. Hurricane Ida did significant damage to the oil and gas infrastructure. When it comes to softs, we have gains for lumber and OJ futures. Meanwhile, losses for sugar, coffee, cotton, and cocoa futures. It's interesting that lumber is climbing higher now. I thought it was transitory. And by the way, remember, lumber futures are down. But the prices of lumber, if you go to Home Depot right now, the prices did not go down for you and I. Prices are still high. If you want to buy a piece of lumber it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg so what's up with that mr powell you know what mr powell's gonna say i told you prices are not gonna go down but the pace of inflation is gonna slow down okay when it comes to metals we have losses for palladium massive losses here over three percent likewise losses for platinum modest ones well we have gains led by copper gold and silver futures what about meats losses for lean hogs by about two percent meanwhile live cattle futures continue to rise higher. What about grains? We have losses led by canola, wheat, oats, even soybean oil futures losing ground today. Meanwhile, modest gains for corn, soybean meal, and rough rice futures, while soybeans futures suffering modest declines. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? The hottest table, once again, is Apple, reclaiming the title from Tesla, which took over yesterday. Apple at number one with about 1 million contracts, about 79% of those were calls. When I see 79% calls, I actually buy puts. It's a sign for a top. We have AMC at number two with about 800,000 contracts, about 70, excuse me, 69% of those were calls. Tesla, the souffle, number three, with about 750,000 contracts. About 45% of those were calls. Again, if I died in 2018, 2019, and I get resurrected, and you show me this table, and you tell me that these are the most active options in the market right now, I'll say, okay, Apple, Tesla, AMC, what the hell is that? What's going on here? AMC is trading more volume than Apple and Tesla. What's going on? More than Amazon and Vinco Ventures. What's going on here? What is that? Support.com. What is this garbage? Clover. But this is the joke. The video game market that we're in right now. Names like AMC, Clover, Support.com, which nobody heard of before. Leading the options market volume absolute insanity how about we move on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today starting with the ticker bbig vinco ventures it remains a hot name being pumped by whoever but i'm assuming hedgies are pumping this one because they're betting millions and millions and millions of dollars in options expiring on friday weekly expiration options again Either these are trust fund babies among the retail community trading these stocks, or we're talking about institutionals being involved in pumping these names. BBIG, I'm still holding puts by the way, hodling, but somebody's bidding for more gains to come tomorrow. By buying the 12 calls expiration date, you guessed it, tomorrow. And by the way, the majority of trades are expiring tomorrow. So there is no value for you to follow these trades. You're not going to be able to, but this is important to study the market and the sentiment. But we'll see how these trades work out, by the way, by tomorrow. The expectations are for BBIG to rise higher by more than 9% by tomorrow, and they bid about 30 cents a piece to buy or to enter this trade all in all betting about six hundred thousand dollars what about the ticker any 
ANY, another meme stock, and they're betting for more gains to come here by buying the eight bucks calls with the expiration date of September 17th. This is the monthly expiration, by the way. I'm not sure if uh, this sticker has weekly expirations like BBIG and SPRT. I believe for now we have monthly options for this name, but they are bidding with the expectations that the name will rise higher by more than 8.5% by then. They paid about 65 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1 million. What about the trade for the ticker SPRT support.com? I was long the name today, but I closed my call options. I'm not going to let them ride. I'm not going to be a greedy pig, but somebody is. And they're buying the 30 bucks calls with the expiration date of, you guessed it, tomorrow, with the expectations that the name will rise higher by more than 9.5% by then. They paid about a buck and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $2 million. Again, is it a trust fund baby gambling with millions of dollars or are these institutionals, hedges and the likes? What about the trade for the ticker USO? This is the US oil fund. So this is a bullish bet for oil prices to rise higher. We already covered the damage from Hurricane Ida, and perhaps this is the catalyst for this trade. They bought the 52 calls with the expiration date of October 15th, with the expectations that the name will rise higher by more than 9% by then. They paid about 40 cents apiece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about half a million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker PLAY? Play. This is Dave and Buster. Again, this is a trade for tomorrow. They bought the 40 bucks calls. This is being engaged right now in the meme stock trade. They're betting with the expectations that the name will rise higher by more than 11% by then. They paid about 45 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $400,000. This is yet another trade against the XLK, the technology ETF. We saw one yesterday. I told you that these are not so common because the risk versus reward when it comes to ETFs, the likes of XLK, it's not really worth it. But when I see unusual activities buying puts on the XLK, I know for sure that we're about to see a pullback, perhaps a big one. In the NASDAQ, the big cap technology names in particular, and in this case, they're buying the 147 puts. The expiration date is October 1st, and the expectations are that the XLK will drop by more than 7% by then. They paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $400,000. Here's another one, perhaps a confirmation that the correction will happen by October, by October 15th to be particular or specific. They're betting for the UDAO to go higher. The UDAO is an inverse ETF for the Dow Jones. Again, highly unusual. Now, what's usual is when we see bets for the UDAO and inverse indices for the market, inverse ETFs, it is usually a sign of high conviction. So whoever buying these calls have high conviction that the market will go down. And in the last few days, we have seen bets against the Dow, against the IWM, against the NASDAQ against technology names. So we have consistency here that either market participants are becoming increasingly cautious or perhaps increasingly confident that the crash will happen. In this case, they bought the UDAO, the 80 bucks calls with the expiration date of October 15th with the expectations that the name will rise higher by more than five and a half percent. They paid about two bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about one and a half million dollars. Heat map, what's going on here? It's all over the place. The market remains themeless. No theme at all. The general theme is red. The general theme is losses, profit taking across the board, with exceptions. So let's talk about these exceptions. In the beginning of the program, we talked about Moderna and Biontech rising higher together, hand in hand. And then we have a name like Peloton rising on uh, yoga pants, optimism. Apparently, Peloton will allow merchandise. And the stock popped higher on merchandise optimism, as if it's a new idea. We'll add billions and billions and billions of dollars for the business. But you know who's already selling merchandise, by the way, and yoga pants? It's Lululemon. And the stock is trading higher by more than 10% today on the heels of earnings. And then weirdly, we also saw the reopening names, whether we're talking about hotels or airlines, also popping higher. Massive gains for names like Marriott, 
and Delta Airlines. What's going on here? Who knows? Perhaps Delta peaking or perhaps optimism of the Biden conference that we saw after hours with the vaccine mandates, perhaps vaccine mandates, more aggressive ones will prompt people to take the shot and therefore airlines, hotels, back in business, baby. Of course, you understand that all of these mandates are a violation of constitutional rights. But hey, who cares about the Constitution anymore, right? Where is the Constitution? Is it over here? Is it over there? I don't see any Constitution. I only see options, calls, puts. Nancy, what are you trading right now? Moving on to charts, starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. The test here is the laws of yesterday, and we're pretty much at the penny here because the SPY closed at 448.96. I believe the lows from yesterday were about 448.78. So what I'm watching here is the violation of the support of the last low. If that happens, then the SPY will flush down all the way, a minimum, to the support of 447. And you'll know the answer, by the way, watching the futures chart. The answer could happen overnight. You'll know right away, are we going to have a double bottom or... Are we about to flush down? This is a daily chart for the continuous contract on the SPY. Again, it appears to be a garden variety pullback for now, a correction back to the trend line, and the SPY will go down from the top by the tune of about 3%. Now, the momentum indicators, we have a confirmation now of the weakness and the loss in momentum. We have a weak candlestick pattern. We have an increase in volume on a down day. What does that mean? We have a confirmation here, folks, that the reversal and the correction is real for now. The cues, what's going on here? 30 minutes chart. Again, weakness, yo-yoing back and forth, back and forth. What's interesting, though, is the chart, the top of the chart for today, went all the way close, but not to the resistance line of 382 and a half. And it pulled back before an attempt to reach the line. What does that mean? A pullback before reaching the resistance level. This is a classic bearish signal, indicating that perhaps we will see more losses to come. In the nasdaq now another point i want to illustrate is the importance of combining information what do i mean sometimes you'll see a bear flag formation for example and if you're following the candlestick patterns alone you will bet that the nasdaq or any chart for that matter showing a bear flag will go down only to be surprised that the chart is actually gapping higher for some reason had you combined the candlestick pattern with the momentum indicators for example the rsi you would have noticed that we have a bear flag while the rsi is at oversold territory and that negates the validity of the bear flag so always make sure that you combine information and not rely on a tunnel vision based on one piece of information this is a daily chart for the continuous contract on the nasdaq when we look at the candlesticks pattern, we have a bull flag formation, a bull flag consolidation. What does that mean? The chart is supposed to pop up higher. But you combine this information with where the RSI is trading, where the MACD indicator is trading, and weakening, by the way. And the likelihood is the bull flag will not play out. You combine that with the surge in volume on down days, and now you have a confirmation that the bull flag is extremely weak and not reliable to bet based upon. Now, if we have a pullback in general in the market, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the SPY, my expectations are the correction will be more extreme in the NASDAQ than the SPY or the IWM. Speaking of, the IWM 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? We have a double bounce now of 223, but the chart remains weak. It lost a lot of steam since the rejection at 229. For now, from the information we have, we got support 223, we got resistance at 229. The chart is trading closer to the support of 223. If that support is broken, then you have 218 at a minimum to look at as support, the next support. And therefore, if you're trading, you're going to buy puts 218 on the IWM. But you got to wait for the violation and a confirmation of the closing below 223. Dixie, what's going on here? We have a weaker day on the heels of a massive bounce from 92. And the Dixie has a lot of steam here, a lot of catalysts. A lot of support to go higher, not just from the correction and the sell-off in the market, if it happens, but the rush to safety from overseas investors, for example, that's another catalyst. On top of that, we have, as we inch closer to tapering, the market will assume that the value of the US dollar will pop higher. So I wouldn't be fighting the dollar here until and unless 
92 is broken and the dollar closing the week below 92. How do you not fight the US dollar? You gotta be careful here in your commodities and inflation bits. If you have copper, if you have materials, if you have energy stocks, they're gonna be shaky as the US dollar continues to pop higher. What about gold? What's going on here? Flattish attempting to find a footing after the massive drop earlier in the week. Now gold will be waiting and waiting and waiting for who? The US dollar to make the move first. But gold also has another enemy in yields. And so far yields have been behaving at least for today and yesterday, which happen to coincide with the auctions, by the way. Yesterday, we had the 10-year auction. Today, we had the 30-year auction. And the demand is stunning from overseas buyers, rushing for the quote-unquote safety of the U.S. bond. But the end effect of inflation will be tapering. And if the Fed stops buying bonds, then we have a problem in the bond market which will push yields higher and bond prices down. For now, what we're watching for is the support of 128. It has been tested before, and we were under the assumption that the test is done. We have a confirmation yields have the green light to move higher. But now, after two hot auctions, two in a row, yields want to go down to 128 and retest the support at that point. TLT weekly chart getting a lot better here. The candle looking a lot better than two days ago, and now trading above 149. The the ultimate closing will be tomorrow, the weekly closing. Where would the candle close? Above 149 or below 149? What do we have tomorrow, by the way, as a catalyst to move the bond market up or down? We have the PPI. We'll see what happens. The VIX, what's going on here? We have a pop from a four hours perspective in the MACD indicator. And every single time, the most reliable indicator right now in the market, every single time, the MACD indicator from a four hours perspective in the VIX chart, every time it popped higher, Creating green impressions in the histogram, we have seen double digits gains in the VIX, which come hand in hand with corrections in the SPY. What do we have here? We have a pop that doesn't appear to be over yet. It appears as if the VIX wants to go all the way up to 20. Now, we know that Fridays are called Crush the VIX Fridays in this hypermania bubble. The moment the VIX pops higher, and closes higher on a Friday, I will comfortably call the market top. We'll see if that happens tomorrow. Apollonia, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Breaking the trend and perhaps going all the way down to 150. And if that happens, I will be watching how Apple behaves at 150 because breaking 150 for support will be another ultimate signal that the market is at the top. So we're watching for the VIX closing above 20 on a Friday. Perhaps that would come hand in hand with Apple closing below 150. It's a long shot, but if it happens, the VIX closing above 20 for the week and Apple closing below 150 for the week, meaning by tomorrow, I will be more than comfortable of calling the market top. For now, I only have Apple puts that I bought today after the chart broke the trend line. I have the 150 puts, we'll see what happens. Tesla, what's going on here? Still flat, nothing going on. Yo-yoing back and forth, back and forth. And this is a chart that moves via call options. We're not seeing buying here. And Tesla, impressively so by the way, has been resilient. The chart has been resilient as the market moves up and down until and unless the pattern of higher highs and higher lows is broken then the chart is still fine the souffle is too hot to eat for bears right now wait till the higher highs and higher lows pattern is over tulips what's going on here still in an attempt to find footing after the shock it's a massive shock a massive drop a flash crash and now everybody's digesting what happened should we buy the dip should we sell should we run should we cover and this process of digesting and debating will go on for a little while up and down up and down i would be more comfortable if the chart goes down to 42,000, retest that support and then bounce higher aggressively for me that would be a signal that the chart has recovered for good but you gotta keep the long-term projection in mind by the way because it's all fun and games until we switch to the monthly chart before i do that remember this and of course market bulls but specifically market pigs hate this chart you bears use this chart all the time to scare us the fud bro and this is gonna be the crash it never happens well let's take a look here we have the takeoff the first sell-off which is a bear trap then the stock pumps up higher again the media attention that we have enthusiasm greed delusion new paradigm then the stock crashes and we have denial you gotta buy the dip nothing will happen they buy the dip the stock bounces higher which is a bull trap by the way they call it a return to normal we're back baby and then what do you know the stock flushes down again 
we get fear, capitulation, and despair, and then the return to the mean. And by then, you lost all your money, you're holding the bag, you're divorced, you have gray hair, you lost your kids, and you're living in a dumpster. So let's see what's going on here with BTC monthly chart. Uh-oh. Tick-tock. Tick-tock. Moving on to AMC, what's going on here? One hour chart, what's going on with the apes? A slight down day, but they continue to buy the dips here, which is impressive. Yet the test will be 52. Can you push the chart all the way to 52 or you're not safe at all? You have a small buffer here, a flimsy one at 42 and a half. This is not good enough for me. I'd like to see 52 as support. And then we have a solid flooring. You don't have to worry about 32 anymore, which is the red line, for me at least. But what's even more interesting is the reliable pattern, at least for now, of the outperformance of meme stocks as the market suffers. So in the general market, the human being market, the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, the Dow, the Russell, when these go down, the meme stocks, the apes, the donkeys, the hyenas, all of a sudden these stocks start to outperform and pump higher. And you saw the pump by the end of the day in meme stocks. BBIG, SPRT, GME, AMC, and your favorite FUCK, all trading higher, popping higher by the end of the day as the market took a nasty leg down. Now we will see if this pattern continues or will at some point the pain becomes so severe in the market the panic spreads all the way to meme land. Lastly, I want to share this chart with you for the ticker STKL. This is for Sun Opta. And I touted this stock on my Twitter page a few days ago, implying that I bought the dip. I already own the stock, but I did buy the dip. And some of you followed me in this trade, but it's not working so far. So here is the threshold for you the stop loss. We have the Fibonacci replacement level of around 920. If the stock breaks 920 and closes below 920 for the week, meaning by tomorrow, then get out and cut your losses because I hate to see you lose money because of me. I'm already in the stock. I bought it a lot cheaper. So even if the stock goes down, it's not going to hurt me, but it will hurt you. So 920, a close below 920, it's over. It's done. You get out. Now, why am I bullish in this name? Number one, the trend of oat milk. Number two, the prices of oats rising higher. And we have already predicted that a long time ago in this channel. We have the biggest shortage of oats since the 1800s. The problem is for Sun Opta is when Oatly, another company, Oat Milk, IPO'd in the market, with an insane valuation. The executives started to dump. It was a pump and dump right away, and it took Sun Opta's stock down with it. But there is a massive difference between Sun Opta and Oatly. Number one, Sun Opta is more diverse and it's not reliant on one product, oat milk, as in Oatly, for example. Number two, the valuation remains reasonable. On top of that, this is a buyout target. Another company is going to acquire this company at some point. It's a steal at this price. Their footprint in the supply chain is extremely large, but the valuation of the company is extremely reasonable. Somebody's going to snatch this one up and therefore I remain bullish on the name. But those of you who got in late in the game, you watch 920. If it trades below 920, it's over. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar? tomorrow. Perhaps the most important number is the PPE, the producer price index. Here is another pulse on inflation, what's going on with the prices among producers. We know that Delta did some damage in employment, at least according to the Fogazi number from the BLS, aka the kitchen, which is being negated by the way as we get weekly unemployment claims at the lowest levels since the pandemic started. But assuming that Delta did damage for the employment picture in the economy and therefore substantial further progress is not met yet even though we had more jobs available than those looking for a job. What about inflation? Did inflation take a hit from Delta? This is what the PPI is about to show us. And if the PPI number come out light, the Fed will jerk off all over the place saying, you know what, we're right. We're not going to taper because we have not met substantial further progress in neither. And we need to wait and wait and wait and continue to grease up Wall Street with a minimum of $120 billion a month. On the other hand, if the PPI comes out hot, indicating that inflation continues to rise higher, then now we have even more evidence of the stagflation phenomenon that's going on in the country right now and perhaps in many other economies. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, 
press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.